Hello, everybody, and welcome back. This is our final session of the Quality Compounding Summit for this year, and I am so excited about this one. Uh, this has many of our great speakers from the last two days coming together and joining us for our speaker panel discussion. Now, we really want your participation and your engagement in this session. So please remember to put uh, your questions in the chat. I also, as a special note for after this session, uh, if you participated in our uh, survey and our scavenger hunt, um, you've got, uh, some winners have been announced and placed in the lobby chat area. So, uh, feel free to check that out and see if you were one of our lucky winners. Fabulous. All right, let's get this started. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this session. Ralph McBride, Kevin Hansen, Thomas Kupek, Dr. Lloyd Allen, and G.G. Davidson. So as a reminder, you know these people, they're fabulous, they're wonderful. If you want to find out more about their bio and background, that can all be found in our speakers tab in the left-hand column. So join me, please, in welcoming everyone back to the panel and over to you, Dr. Kupek. Thank you, Heather, very much. You know, this has been a great uh, culmination of uh, talks the last two days, and we want to thank everyone for attending. We want to thank our sponsors, and we want to thank the, the presenters and the speakers. Uh, this is, I think, our fifth year, uh, and it's, I think it, it went well, and it was really a pleasure and an honor to participate in this exciting Quality Compounding Summit this year in 2021. Hopefully next year it will be in person. This last session, as Heather has indicated, we're going to start with a panel discussion, and we'll throw it out, and please, anyone out and uh, attendees, please submit your questions. It's meant to be a dialogue and an open um, uh, question and answer type approach. We've had some preliminary questions submitted previously, and so we'll start with one that's, uh, and anybody, feel free to uh, chip in and answer. With a 503As, 503Bs and manufacturers providing sterile preparation and products, what gaps still exist today and how can we close those gaps to ensure safe and efficient patient care? I can get us kicked off with this one. Um, I think as we look at this, this, this current realm with, with the 503As, 503Bs and manufacturers is one element where there's still a gap is with regards to uh, drug shortages. We know that sterile injectable products are most prone um, to that of, of shortages with uh, you know manufacturing issues and other raw ingredient issues going into that. Um, and so as we look into our current environment, um, you know this is something where our 503Bs really potentially could be positioned to help. Um, as you saw, over 80% of our 503Bs are registered um, to perform uh, non-sterile to sterile compounding using bulk API that could really help to get through some of these shortages. However, in the current context, the FDA does not allow 503Bs to compound these, these preparations until it is a true recognized FDA drug shortage. Um, and there is a significant lag from when it actually gets to, uh, you know, even supply chain disruptions or allocations to a true shortage. And in the meantime, our 503As and our frontline you know, um, compounders and providers are struggling to try to meet patient need. And it could be several months to you know, several weeks extended out before it is a recognized shortage for then a 503B then to even begin the testing to provide those products. And so in the current context, that is still a significant gap and something that I hope could be changed. One potential recommendation could be instead of FDA adopting saying they can make it from the their FDA shortage list of what about adopting ASHP's drug shortage list? It's it's much more timely. Things are being um, you know, submitted to ASHP as soon as supply chain disruptions are being seen on the front lines and it can be recognized much sooner so then our 503Bs can actually help to provide to meet those patient needs. Excellent, Kevin. There was another question that came in for you. Are you using an alternative sterility test method if so, which technology 
and what has been your experience? Yeah, gr great question. Um, so we, we do, um, we've shifted the majority of our protocols over to rapid um, sterility. Um, there is a process of doing that, of course, as we described, um, your methods have to be validated. You have to have methods that are non-inferior um, to the, the USB 71 test. And so there is some time and investment involved uh, to get there. Um, out of the different tests that are out there, um, we, we are using the Celsius system, which is an ATP bioluminescence. Um, and that uh, quarantine period from that non-inferiority study to ensure that you're going to be able to depict a non-sterile um, sample um, was determined to be a six-day uh, quarantine period. And so as we've um, you know, looked at that traditional USB 71 test with a 14 or greater uh, day quarantine period, reducing that to six days, that can extremely help from uh, both an operational efficiency um, to get more of the life out of the beyond use date and more of an opportunity for those products to be used such they're not wasted and could even help to prevent some of those, those drug shortage issues if we're able to use those, those preparations longer. So we've had really good um, experience with it. It also gives us confidence in the fact that the results are objective results, that it's based off a luminometer detecting that amount of light instead of somebody holding it up and trying to say, yeah, that looks turbid, maybe, maybe not. And so it has certainly has given us a level of confidence within um, the products that we test for sterility. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Ralph, we have a question that came in from the attendees for you. Are you aware of any new emerging technologies for clean rooms designs and or functions? Uh, you're you're off on mute, Ralph. Yeah, thank you. But uh, would you would you be so kind to, to give me that question one more time? Absolutely. Are you aware of any new emerging technologies for clean room design and or function? Sure. Uh, I will tell you that, in fact, today you saw an example in Kevin's presentation where they've taken uh, they've, they've taken the water source and, and removed it. Uh, they've, they've changed the distance from the buffer room. And so we're seeing lots of iterations uh, within the industry. And uh, I'm not sure there's a perfect one yet, but we seem to keep getting better at this. Um, you know, if you think about Kevin's presentation today and some of the things that I said, this industry is in a rapid state of change. And uh, I think as long as we're all willing to think differently, uh, we will continue to see improvements. Excellent. Thank you very much. Gigi. The FDA seems to have no trouble at all in drafting and imposing guidance for human compounding. Why is there still no guidance for animal compounding almost 25 years after the Food and Drug and Modernization was passed in 97? I wish I knew with certainty what the answer to that question was, Tom. Um, it, it's probably because there are so many different stakeholders that they can never agree on what guidance will work best for the entire industry. What I would like to see happen is perhaps maybe a consideration of companion animals being treated more like humans so that we can do anything that the prescriber needs to do to take care of dogs and cats and horses particularly. Um, I think that would make it easier. And then the food animal people and the wild animal people can, you know, work on other sorts of, um, of guidance. But I think if we lump dogs, cats, and horses into the same box with humans, then um, I think we'll be better off. And I, I wanted to camp on to Kevin's question about the 503Bs. A lot of um, 503Bs are providing outsourced products for dogs, cats, and horses right now. And that is a tremendous gap in, in regulatory standard because the laws are different for dogs, cats, and horses. So those 503Bs are operating um, at a completely different level than 503Bs that are producing sterile compounds for humans. Uh, so I, I, I I don't know the true answer to that question, but I know that stakeholders, particularly um, veterinarians themselves and the Animal Health Institute, the Veterinary Pharma are at odds, 100% polar different positions on what the guidance should be. Excellent, excellent. Um, here's a question, uh, Dr. Allen, this might be, how can compounders prepare for future advancements 
in pharmaceuticals and compounding? Well, probably the primary uh, aspect of, of this is keeping up to date. And I know a lot of pharmacists, once they graduate from college and, and they get into work or they start uh, building up their compounding practice and things like that, they get so biz busy that in a lot of cases, uh, their education seems to be put on hold. And it's important that people keep up. And the primary way of keeping up is attending meetings such as this and others that occur throughout the year. And, uh, you know, like Kevin and Ralph mentioned a while ago, there's a lot of things that are changing. And the only way to keep up with change is by constantly reading and attending meetings and finding out what is going on. Look at the exhibit halls and see what new equipment is coming out, what new testing methods are coming out. But it's imperative that each and every pharmacist uh, basically has to do this on their own. Now, a lot of state boards obviously have enacted required continuing education uh, hours for renewal of their licenses every year. And some states have even gone to the point of um, dictating so many hours in sterile or so many hours in law, et cetera. You know, and this is fine. But as far as keeping up in your specific area, whether it's uh, BHRT, pain management, or topical transdermals, or pediatrics, or whatever, it's up to the individual to keep up. And um, it's not something that can be done automatically. It takes a concerted effort. Uh, you know, just like you and I, we have to keep up in, in what we do all the time. And it's done by reading and attending meetings and visiting with people. Um, and so that it's very critical, especially as we're in an era of rapidly changing technology in the area of compounding. Excellent. I have a couple of questions from attendees. Uh, these were anonymous questions that came in. Kevin, can you speak to the new FDA draft guidance what are your thoughts on the disconnect between the FDA and the USP? Yeah, excellent question. And, and I think before we, we dive into that, I need everyone to, to zen with, before we get into this document and say, everything's going to be okay. Let's, let's take it. Let's read it. Let's, you know, let's discuss it, but let's not react. Um, so I'll, I'll say that as a preface before I, before I go into this. So I think right off the get-go, it's, it's important to know that in today's realm, uh, USP and FDA have different definition of what is considered compounding and what is not considered compounding, right? And so I think in our context, when we think, you know, compounding in a 503A setting, it's, you know, if you're, you know, touching, looking, manipulating a drug, you know, it's a very broad definition that's considered compounding, but FDA has a, has a different view on that, right? If you're using FDA conventionally manufactured products, the reconstitution, the mixing, they don't consider that compound. Right. So I think when you're looking at this and you're seeing compounding, you have to ask yourself, what activities are you doing that fits within that context? That would be the first thing that I would do, um, you know, from 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 that perspective. Now, are there certain things in that document that need to be clarified? Absolutely. Things like what is within pharmacy and what is with outside of pharmacy? Um, uh, there's there's various elements there. And I encourage folks that as there's some, some confusion there is to submit public comments. So we're doing that on behalf of our organization to uh, seek some clarity on uh, some of those rulings. Um, but I also would not, you know, jump right to that quote unquote 24 hour rule. And in fact, go back to some of the background. You see that in every single one of these documents, they refer to the NECC tragedy and they want to prevent that. The compounding that was occurring there is high risk compounding, um, using non sterile ingredients. Those are the things that are causing these contamination events. That is the focus. Um, and, and so, it, you know, they even said in this document right, right off the get goes, they don't have resources to go out to every 6,000 hospital to evaluate this. And they just laid some context to say, here are some risky things that may get you on our risk that we would consider. So I think evaluate what you're doing. It are some of those things, those risky practices. And if not, great, then determine what you need to do for your organization and your patients and, and move on. But Zen and, and don't react, you know, as this is just a draft guidance document, it's in its current setting. Now, another question came out from an attendee. 
It said, Kevin, do you see the new proposed 24 hour rule as something that will be enforceable? Do you plan on changing your operations in any way? Yeah, I, I, you know, my personal opinion on that, I don't, I don't see how that addresses really their need. Um, you know, I think they went through a one mile radius rule and, and we said we wanted a time base instead of a, a, a distance base and they gave us a time based. Um, so I think, you know, FDA is trying to address what we want. Um, but, but really, you know, from my standpoint, as we currently have uh, in our 503 practice setting, USP 797 restricted beyond use dates, and those dates are already there. Those, those systems for safety are already established. And so um, largely that's what we are going to, you know, recommend to the FDA from our organization. Excellent. Thank you. With a variety of sources available for raw materials, what are the top three things we need to consider when picking a source provider? I think uh, this is an applicable question that maybe each of you could uh, would feel free to answer that. But with a variety of sources for raw materials, what are the top three things we need to consider when picking a source provider? I'll start with that, Tom. Um, I think my top priority would obviously be making sure it is from an FDA registered supplier and that's easy enough to check. Um, there's a database that's very frequently updated and you can tell who is registered and who is not and when they've most recently been inspected. Um, for me, the second would be, is it compendial grade? Um, is it um, USP and F? would be the first priority, but is it available from another world compendial standard um, if, if, if not available in USP? And then the third factor for me would be what I mentioned in my talk this morning, um, to avoid red listed folks on the import list because number one, that's a red flag for quality concerns and issues, but it's also um, like throwing your money in the ocean because <laughs> you won't get it back once it's it's impounded in customs. So those would be my top three. Excellent. Dr. Allen and maybe Kevin, and Ralph. Uh, I think Gigi hit it right on the, the nose. Um, USP and F grade, compendial grade. Uh, is critical from an FDA registered facility. In fact, those are required, um, you know, in DQSA. And we can't help but also look at two things. One is the reputation of the supplier, and two would be the services that they offer. Um, and, you know, you can't overemphasize how important it is to develop a good relationship with the supplier so that you can be honest and straightforward, uh, especially when any situation comes up that might need to be addressed. But those things along with what Gigi mentioned, I think are very important. Excellent, excellent. Kevin, do you have, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, I think um, adding additional context to this is to not use them if you don't need to use them. I think just even starting from that simple basic context, you know, we see within our 503Bs is some of their products they offer from an API and a sterile to sterile. Um, and, and obviously the FDA is, is working on addressing that. Um, it is in some cases maybe uh, less expensive to use API. Um, but if it's not on shortage and there is sterile to sterile available, at least when selecting products from a 503B, I hope that many of our policies would, you know, um, would prefer purchasing the sterile to sterile to reduce that risk to the patient. So that's one additional thing that I wanted to add to that context. And I might add one thing too, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, it's very critical, obviously, to do APIs uh, if possible, because you know the, uh, the strength or the potency of the API. Whereas when you do sterile to sterile using commercial products, you don't really know what the actual concentration is because of the ranges that are allowed. And so if it's going to be something that's going to be tested and may, you know, put you in a negative light, uh, which can occur, then you need to be careful using commercial products because you actually don't know what the final concentration is in your starting ingredients. That's, those are all excellent comments. I know within each of your individual talks, uh, 
pieces of that came out. I really like the idea. I mean, just the point that the, the criteria of acceptance criteria for those APIs are so tight. I mean, those raw materials are left off at a 1% or one and a half, or you, as you, as Dr. Allen was talking in Gigi, you know, maybe 10% uh, or even some greater on those other areas. And it's not uncommon for them to be off. In addition, you know all those other excipients that might be present in that total uh, in that formulation versus a raw uh, API. So those are all excellent comments. Um, are there therapies that you will see that will become more prominent in the next five to ten years? Um, are there therapies that you'll you see that will become more prominent in the next five to ten years that compounders or compounding pharmacy might be utilized? Interesting question. Anybody? I can approach it from the formulation standpoint. You know, I think uh, a short history shows and projection into the future that we're going to see a lot more drug products formulated as transdermals for transdermal administration. You know, it's convenient. Uh, they're, it's good for compounding. And then once compounding gets involved in a specific drug, then in many cases, the manufacturers pick it up and, and carry it on. So uh, there's a lot of new formulas coming out for transdermals. And there's another interesting one that I'm, I might mention too, uh, kind of related to this, and this is the brand new aspirin product that is out. You know, uh, it's a microemulsion type capsule, uh, just straight aspirin, but it's being promoted now for, you know, stroke prevention and easier on the GI tract. And basically all it is, is aspirin in an oil matrix, um, you know, and encapsulated into a soft gelatin capsule. But anyway, I think there's a lot of new formulations that's going to be uh, coming out, some will obviously be compounded first and then go to the manufacturers and then some will come straight from the manufacturers. But, you know, for, with my background, I tend to look at formulations rather than disease states. But anyway, that's my two cents there. That's excellent. I'm going to play the devil's advocate on this issue since we're talking about transdermal and drug permeation studies. How do you feel because we know what has occurred in the past with the pain creams, but, or even now with the testosterone pellets and the implants, the lack of clinical data or the question that might come up, how is that best handled? Any of you regarding the drug delivery and the kinetics of that? Uh, especially on transdermal, and knowing the matrix is going to have that effect as far as the level of penetration uh, or, or the solubility. I mean, it, as Gigi was talking about earlier, it made me think of the cefotrioxone when it was, we did a study many years ago, and there was definitely a, 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 an issue there, and, and you were bringing that up in your study. So I think that we often think, we, I, you know, it, to me, compounding is really pharmaceutics. It's a lot of it is basic pharmaceutics. And as individuals move away or, or don't get as much training in that, perhaps in pharmacy school, and, and regardless, I think that's a big basic concept or basic knowledge that may be lacking. And, um, but I want to get your thoughts on, on that. That's an interesting question. I mean, as we move in there and we look at these formulas, you're... Dr. Allen, you're muted. I, I had it. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, this is very similar to where we were probably 20 years ago with stability studies. Right. You know, unfortunately, a lot of people and a lot of companies and uh, facilities are stepping up in order to help fill the gap. It takes time and it takes money. And it's necessary in transdermal studies. Well, first of all, we need them, no question about it. Some of the companies are starting to do some studies with their uh, transdermal bases and things like that, and this is good, uh, but it's like the stability studies, it does take time for the data to be generated and disseminated. So, um, you know, we'll get there. 
but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. I know, just as a side note uh, for the USP, uh, they have done a lot of really good uh, promotions of stability work in the last decade or so. And so they're continuing to, uh, to put information out uh, on stability monographs that the, the committees uh, ha have done a good job on and trying to pull together formulations that are, are and, and the monographs development from that process. So I think these professional organizations are continuing to move in that direction. I think it's an exciting time. And I really like what Kevin had indicated earlier, take a Zen moment. You know, I think it's easy to react myself as a, you know, quick to think, you know, we need to slow down and be quick, slow to speak and slow to, to really think through these issues. Um, so that, that, that's good. Um, speaking of, of formulations, Dr. Allen, why is it important to consider excipients or anyone to answer this question, Ralph or Kevin or Gigi, uh, why is it important to consider excipients in a drug formulation for stability? Basically, the bottom line is excipients can either make or break the product, you know, both therapeutically as well as uh, stability-wise. So um, I think I mentioned yesterday uh, in response to a question that excipients need to be taught more uh, because, like I said, they can help to support a stable uh, compounded preparation. Um, and some excipients are suitable for some patients and some are not. Um, and I think in our colleges, the, they do a great job with the APIs and the actual drug and its effect and the clinical stuff uh, associated with that. But then we're not teaching enough about excipients, which, like I said, can either make or break a product. It, exactly. I know that was a slide that I presented in my talk yesterday that showed exactly what you, we plotted the decrease of the API, but then when we went to the excipient and looked at the degradant and then the various different types of excipients that was a substituted, you can see the increase of rate of degradation. And then when you plot that degradant versus the API decrease, the increase of the degradant versus the API versus the change in the excipient, it was dramatic. Let's have a question for Ralph. The USP 797 states that certifications will be performed by a qualified individual. My certifier has responded to my request for their credentials with a statement that they have been performing certification for 20 years. Is this sufficient? Wow. Um, thank you for that. You know, it seems to me the, the theme for this entire discussion we've had over two days is change and rapid change, right? And so if you're steeped in something that you were taught 20 years ago and you haven't uh, kept up and, and you're, you haven't performed the necessary CEs and other credentialing things, then, then I would worry about that uh, certifier. So if you're getting that response, um, it, it, would, it would certainly set off an alarm bell in my mind. Uh, let's talk about some ways that people prove that they're competent. Certainly, if you've been doing it for some period of time, that's, that's just one element. But uh, for those people that have passed the CETA National Testing Board, uh, that would be a, a certainly a feather in their hat. People who then uh, certified by NSF to do uh, biological safety cabinets. Uh, so uh, it's really a little bit of art and a little bit of science. But um, answering your question with I've been doing this for 20 years, I don't think that's really going to get you where you want to go. Very good, Ralph. Thank you. We have a question from Bradley Sprecher. Thank you, Bradley, for submitting the question. It's for Dr. Allen. Is there a list of the FDA approved manufactured products with acceptable purity ranges of concern for compounders? Any particular issues of the IJPC we should refer to? What I would uh, refer to is, um, you know, we're required to use USP or NF grades. And if you look at the monograph for each active ingredient, there is a range it's called the purity rubric. And like Dr. Kubik mentioned just a minute ago, most of these are like between 98 and 102 percent for the API. And so uh, that would be my primary source um, to find out exactly how tight it does need to be. Um, and what was the second part of that, Dr. Kubik? I see it says, uh, any particular issues of the IJPC that we should look at or refer to? Uh, 
Oh, it's hard to think of <laughs> right offhand. Uh, tell you what, if you'd like to email me that question, I will certainly look into it and see what we have published in the past. You know, it's been 25 years of publication, so there's a lot of journals to look through, but I'll, and I'll search and, and definitely we'll provide you with what resources we've got. And, and if I may add to that, I would say any product that does not have a USP product monograph um, is immediately suspect because you're mm -hmm. not going to get a batch record out of that manufacturer for that product. You have no idea what the strength range is for the specs on that product. And that is the vast majority of veterinary products. As I mentioned this morning, only 180 out of like 2,200 products that are marketed have product monographs. Wow. Um, here's a question uh, for Kevin. I, we, I don't know if I asked this question or not, but how does, how does Kevin decide which products to make are on a robot versus manual compounding? We already asked that initially, or did we discuss that? I don't think so, not yet. Not. Yeah. Uh, how, do, how do you decide which products to make on a robot versus manually compounding? Yeah. I, I think the first thing to, you know, to know is, you know, um, in, in the current context of the IV robots is, is knowing that there is limitations in how efficient um, they can produce. So it's not going to produce everything on your formulary um, unless you're, you know, you, you have many robots. Um, and so you have to be realistic that you're, you're likely only going to be able to compound certain types of preps. Well, my kind of thought process is, is only compounding the ones that I, that I need to. So some, some things that I'm thinking through of going through there is if there is a conventionally manufactured product, and we're really talking about sterile compounds only for, for this, is, is we're going to buy it, we're going to use it because that is the safest preparation. We're not going to make something that there is that. You've seen those essentially copies in the FDA guidance that is something of interest of theirs as well. And so we, we want to be um, safe from that perspective. Next is looking at how would you prepare it on the robot? Is it a simple uh, repackaging? Is it a taking it out of a sterile vial and putting it into a different container? Um, or is it going to be very complex where you're having to remove volume from a bag, reconstitute, do a dilution? Um, things that are really complex, unfortunately, run pretty slow on the robots in the current environment. And so that may take up the whole operation just to produce a single protocol. So there's a careful balance with all of the different variables. So then you have a well-balanced program that's actually meeting your needs. And I say meeting your needs is you've got to start with what is your goal of this? Is it to reduce your manual admixtures from your, your main clean room? Is it to produce hazardous chemotherapy on a patient-specific basis in a highly accurate manner? Is it to make batch, you know, preparations and, you know, so you don't have supply chain disruptions from your outsourced products. I think starting with your goal and then working through what's realistic and what you can do, um, things that are very high volume, it may not make sense for you to do those and continue to outsource those. Things that are very complex, continuing to outsource those. Um, if you've seen the ISMP sterile compounding guidelines, they kind of give some context about when really outsourcing should be considered. And so those are things that um, we certainly looked at when we look at what products that we should run on our devices. The other thing too is that list is always being uh, reviewed and looked at. Is it is it current? You know, um, uh, you know. Previously, we were preparing glycopyrrolate syringes, and there was a conventionally manufactured glycopyrrolate syringe on the market. So we discontinued that, and we said, "What can we add next? What stability study can we do to to do that?" So it's kind of a constant evolution of looking at our our robotic formulary. Excellent, excellent answer. We really appreciate that. Uh, here's a, a question. How do you determine the number of time points in a stability study? Gigi from the seventh previous past chair of the 797 committee or Dr. Allen? I learned everything I know on that subject from you and Dr. Allen, so I'm going to defer to the experts. <laughs> okay, Dr. Allen. I learned everything I knew oh. from Dr. Allen. <laughs> well, basically, uh, whenever you're setting up a stability study, um, characteristics of the drug and characteristics of the treatment program for the patient. In other words, there's no need to do a stability study for seven days if the treatment period is going to be, you know, 21 days or 30 days or whatever. Um, sad to say, a lot of studies are done and stopped after 14 days or 30 days when 
the cost of extending those studies for another seven to 15 days or even 30 days or whatever um, is minimal because you've already uh, been at the expense of methods development and, and study design and things like that. So, you know, I would say that when we started out back in the 70s, you know, we would generally look at 30 days, you know, two weeks to 30 days as being okay. But obviously, in today's world, uh, that's really not uh, sufficient time. And so, so many of them that we see today are being done for at least 60 days. And 60 days seems to be reasonable. Uh, there are obviously considerations that you may need to go further. Or if the drug is obviously not that stable, then you may need to do a, a, a shorter. Uh, but you've already got the time points in between zero and 60, so you can simply utilize those. But anyway, there's a lot to be involved. Uh, patient considerations, analytical considerations, sample handling considerations. Um, and so all of those kind of come into your overall protocol for a specific stability study. But just don't make them too short when they should be longer. Oh, absolutely. I want to echo that. Really like 90% of the, of the revenue that's incurred on a stability study is probably a lot of it is that the method development at the validation and then it's a shame because you got to do your time zero and then as he said dr allen said you know 14 day 20 day and i'm asking you to extend it even further i mean if you're going to do 90 days don't go 90 days do 120 you know do 120 days or do you know uh, uh, even a year so go past that once it's in there, you really want to stretch it and see it because you capture a good a lot of amount of data out there. Don't on this instance, I don't think you want just the minimal viable product. I know there's a lot of six sigma and there's a lot of pieces from a process looking at minimal minimal viable product, but I think from a stability study, really want to ensure those timeline, those those time points cover the point at which you are administering that to the patient but then extend that beyond well because there's, and, and consider that extra time. Um, uh, Ralph, this is a question I think would be good for you. How many of the CETA documents referenced in your presentation are from 2006 and 2010? Will CETA be updating those documents to address upcoming changes in the USP 797? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And yes, CETA has been really hard at work over the last two years uh, reviewing all of their documents. Uh, there are roughly 10 or 11 CETA documents. The main one that we talked about yesterday is CETA 003. And I can tell you that that committee finished its work uh, in 2020 and that document's still under review. So it's, it's to be released uh, any day. They may be holding it based on some of the stuff in the, propose, the September proposal. I don't know that for sure, uh, uh, but if you go on their website, they've updated a number of documents. And if you do environmental monitoring, uh, they really had some best practices come out in, I think it's 009. So uh, take a look at those. Uh, and um, if you don't have them, certainly work with your certifier because uh, you could review them with that, that person. All right, I wanna encourage uh, those that are attending this morning to keep those questions coming. We're getting some good questions in, but if you guys, anybody thinks of a question, uh, please submit it in the chat box. Keep those good questions coming. Here's a question for any and all. Since 2013, when the 503Bs were first introduced, we, we currently have only around 74, I think is what Kevin presented this morning on the 503 outsourcing uh, facilities serving over 6,000 hospitals in the nation. What are your thoughts on what has prevented compounders from registering as 503Bs and how can we continue to provide safe patient care in the interim? I think that's a really important uh, question and you know, even goes back to some of the gaps that we, we currently see today in providing the, these sterile um, preparations. Um, a couple of things that, that I think about of, you know, why, why have not more hospitals, why have not more organizations opted to create their own 503Bs is once you really get into the depths of it, um, some of, you know, there's some certain some documents of even the facility definition 
are extremely restrictive um, and, uh, you know, would require building an entire offsite facility dedicated to that operation. There is extensive overhead costs in doing so. And many of these hospitals are running, you know, less than 1% operation margins. You know, hospitals are not for profit in most cases and, and simply don't have the funds. And to have a massive multi-million dollar capital investment to do it and, you know, to only serve patients at their facility, it, 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 it's not financially viable. And so I think, um, you know, a potential opportunity is, is there laxing of some of the facility definition that could allow existing infrastructure, still having some of those CGMP practices in place, um, you know, that, that we're seeing um, revisions coming out even from our 503Bs. Um, but, but that facility definition, I think, is really important. The upfront costs are really important. Um, are, you know, is there merit into it and seeing it in the future? I think, obviously, the FDA um, in their document would like to see more folks register as 503Bs. But I think until some of those things change um, and, uh, you know, and we see even the challenges with our, the, the 74 503B facilities that exist is they even have challenges meeting what the FDA is looking for. And so there either needs to be clear guidance um, which we are seeing with FDA with their, their compounding center of excellence of training and educating, which is a huge gap right now, so they can meet what FDA is looking for. But I also think within that of the facility definition, um, you know, what other operations could be happening within that facility would at least allow a greater opportunity for more, more folks to consider actually registering as a 503B. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just pile on that, if I may. Um, I think one of the things that as I talk with pharmacies across the United States, the 483 thing scares them to death. So this transparency thing, it, it, they don't understand that transparency and continuous improvement are one and the same. And so they look at the 483 as a bad thing. I look at it as, okay, you've got had an expert in here that's given you some ideas on how to improve your operation. Let's, so let's, uh, Let's all get around that and, and make it happen. So I wish we could transfer from 483 bad to 483 good. You know, I just wanted to uh, comment. I like your, I think that's an excellent comment, Ralph, because, you know, I think it, it's a cultural shift. I remember uh, initially and when testing, I, I was surprised 23 years ago when, when we were asking about testing and are you testing and they know, I don't want to know. And I was shocked to even hear that, couldn't even believe that thought process. And I think the idea of transparency and opening up is, is healthy, you know, just in our relationships, just in general communication. So I think it's good to know and you can't, it, and it's like you said, it's a continuous process development. I like to see Kevin did a great job on his talking about quality by design and then your idea, your engineering uh, uh, information through your talks. And I think it the transparency is critical and it's creating a cultural shift in the thought process toward this quality. Another thing that I think Gigi and others mentioned yesterday is the collaboration. I think to be competitive in that compounding industry, we need to have a greater mind of collaboration and community and, and approach versus, oh, you're doing this robots, no, I'm not, or I can't afford that. Which brings up to a question that Gigi had uh, had, had brought up. Can Kevin, Kevin talk a little bit about investing in the robots that you, that you talked about this morning? Basically, how much to purchase or how much to lease or how do you decide which is better, if at all? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Um, now, obviously, with you know the use of of compounding technology and automation, you know th those do come at a cost. But I think as you go through and, and start with your goals, is you know the quality, the safety, the things that we talk about all wraps up to really providing value back to the patient. And so, um, you know, one of the things that's in the denominator of our, of our value equation is through cost reduction. So I think, you know, as I talked about having a balance of what you're running on your robot is making sure, you know, if you're just doing things to reduce the volume in your, your main clean room, um, you're, you're probably not going to be financially viable to keep, you know, to make those robots really financially worth it if, and from that perspective. But adding things in where you could focus on waste reduction, you know, drug waste in hospitals and other setting um, can be tremendous amounts of dollars that are on the table of opportunity. 
and using an IV robotic system, uh, performing, you know, vial aliquots, perf um, providing extended, you know, beyond use states to reduce the, uh, the waste that's there, that can have considerable dollars through actually tackling and addressing that waste and actually help us with our drug shortage problems that, you know, that we continue to see. So I think you have to be very mindful of going in um, and looking at the cost of these types of devices, but ultimately looking back and saying, how is this going to provide value back to our patients and how is it going to provide um, value back to our organization? And if you look at it in the right way, you'll see that there's a tremendous value opportunity there for use of this technology. And as more hospitals and customers continue to utilize them, we, we would hope that the, you know it, it will be... Um, more financially viable for more organizations rather than just large um, institutions. You know, what about our rural hospitals? Is there opportunities to put robots in these in these settings as well? Um, you know, right now a lot of them are just justifying trying to find a hood. You know, in a segregated compounding area. So we have to be careful and think about all the different practice settings and and how we can how we can assist with that and where do robots fit in. Ralph, we had a question. Uh, what should I do if my certifier tells me a test I learned about today is not necessary? Yeah, that, this goes back to the whole thing of change. Uh, it goes back to the whole process of change. So if that certifier is uh, remembering something from 10 years ago and it's not quite up to date with USP, so the, uh, it would be of concern. So the first thing is ask yourself, is it something that's required by USP 797? And we did that chart yesterday that reviewed those things. So that is, that is without a doubt the gold standard. If there is any, uh, in any gray area, uh, I would urge you to have a conversation with CETA uh, themselves. I have called CETA and traditionally what they will do is they will have one of their CETA board members who's, who may be a past president of CETA call you back. And when you get the answer from that authority, that's the answer. So, uh, and those guys are wonderful to work with. They want to share the knowledge. They want to improve the industry. So I would, I would follow that path. Thank you very much. Um, Kevin, do you have any guidance in how to position a robot within a clean room to promote, this would be Kevin or, or um, Ralph or anyone, uh, do you have any guidance in how to position a robot within a clean room to promote proper sterility assurance. I certainly welcome uh, Ralph's on this thoughts and, and I'll, I'll maybe get us kicked off on this is, you know, in the presentation described, of course, of placing those devices in an ISO class seven or better um, buffer room, but you also have to, you know, I call it the spaghetti diagram. What's occurring in and around it? How do materials get to and from that device? How do people get to and from that device? You know, do you have it in a tight corner where there's a lot of traffic? And so being very mindful of that. Um, so we had the opportunity when we uh, installed IV robots is we actually designed and built a brand new cleaner. So we built the cleaner with in mind of the size of these robots, what's around them, do they have the right power? Um, we actually placed the, um, the wall return and vents right by the robot. So any type of particulates or anything that could be generated from them is immediately being removed from the clean room. Um, you know, um, making sure that there's, you know, stainless steel tables for product movement and flow. But, um, you know, when, when uh, we met uh, with, with some FDA consultants when we designed this clean room, I was really excited, hoping I was going to get this checklist of all these things that we need to include. And they, and they actually made it very simple. They said, you need unidirectional flow of product and unidirectional flow of people. That's it. I was like, Really? I was like, where's the, where's all the other stuff? And it was like, that's all you got to do. And so we, we really thought um, about that um, in our design and placement of, of those robots too. And one of the things that I'm glad that we had the foresight is when you build and design these clean rooms, uh, it's very uh, disruptive to try to go in and, you know, make any changes to your clean room after it's dysfunctional is don't plan for necessarily today, but plan for the future as well. So we started in our clean room with two robots, but luckily I had the foresight. I was like, you know what? I I'm thinking that probably we're going to get some additional robots in the future. So we, we made a whole spot for that third robot. And within the first year of our program, we now already have a third robot um, there. So definitely think about the future and making sure that you're, you know, have enough space to do that. So, you know, you're not having a, a, a robot in a very tight spot that could, you know, not promote the sterility of that. Oh, excellent. 
Yeah, a couple of things I would add to that. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm not, I don't know who Kevin's uh, certification uh, expert is, but I would imagine he involved them in this process. And they probably said, you know what, uh, the CETA documents really don't address this robot uh, stuff that we're going to have in the future. So we're going to follow the manufacturer's information on this. Uh, so uh, you need a couple of partners. You need a good certification expert who's willing to say, I don't know what I don't know. Uh, and you need uh, the uh, manufacturer of that robot who's going to help you figure out the things that, that must be and must not be done. And great point. And even during that certification process is making sure all those folks are in the room. It's not just your certifier, but you have the robotic engineer that knows all the functionality of that device. You have your operating personnel in the room to get your dynamic conditions. It's a, it's definitely a coordinated efforts when you have these things to make sure that they're certified in the right way. Because to your point, you know, CETA does not give guidance about how to certify these types of equipment. Excuse me. It, very good. This is a question for, for anyone. Have you ever had any batch failures due to microbiological growth? And if so, what was determined as the root cause? Any batch failures due to microbiological growth? And if so, what was the determined root cause? Kevin, you wanna start with you? Sure. Um, so the, the quick answer is we have not. Um, so we, we've performed uh, since the, the start of our IV robotics program um, over 2,000 batches, um, which had constituted with the sampling um, uh, following USP 71 um, of over 11,000 samples actually going through sterility testing um, across, you know, um, 250,000 CSPs uh, contained in those batches. And we have not had a sterility testing failure to date, knock on wood and all of these things. But, but again, I, you know, I do, I don't use those numbers and, and this is why it was not in my presentation, because to me, that, that is not a measure from my standpoint of whether we have quality processes or not. Um, it's, it's really telling me we did not have those gross contamination failures. So if we did, if we did have um, a failure, I think was part of the question. Um, I think first and foremost, especially in a batching operation, you know, these things aren't going to a patient immediately is you can shut down operations and you can do a full investigation. Um, we have uh, cameras uh, throughout all of our, not only our robots, but actually in the room. So we can see and go back and review everything that occurred during that specific batch. Uh, we have a very strict definition of what is a batch. It's, it's, it's actually down to the robot level. So if there was a failure, we could tie it back to a, a specific person, a specific robot. And, and we actually partnered with our board of pharmacy to develop our definitions for what is considered a batch. But you have to have those, um, uh, those strong um, pieces in place to be able to do those investigations. And I think, you know, we had some great presentations that talked about the sterility testing failure um, investigations. And so um, I think those things are, are, are important because inevitably going back to that law is something is going to, you know, something could occur. And when you do have that, you have to be prepared and being able to address um, what that root cause is. Very good. Anyone else? Well, with that, this has been an excellent question and answer session, and we really appreciate all the questions that have came in. We appreciate all the panelists. And Heather, I think we'll turn it over to you.